Welcome to the Cities Migration Learning Exchange. Today's webinar is the third in a three-part series that is being co-hosted with Higher Immigrants to bring to life the recently released report, Investing in Refugee Talent, Lessons Learned in Labor Market Integration. In today's final session in the webinar series, we're exploring Collaborating for Success, Refugee Training Programs Built with Industry Insights. The role of employers in industry is critical to ensure refugee employment programs are training refugees for available employment opportunities, and the skills that they develop will meet needs of industry. Today we will explore two exceptional examples of program development that captures the needs of both refugees and industry alike to create pathways to employment. To help us unpack these important messages and talk more specifically about the program details, we are joined by two fantastic colleagues in the field that are running and leading the charge in these fabulous programs. Joining us from Emma's Torch in New York City, we have Edric Wang, the program associate. And joining us from Layuna Local 506 in Toronto is Marissa Preston, the training liaison. And my name is Devin Franklin. I'm the project manager of Higher Immigrants, and I'll be your host and moderator today as our lead from Cities of Migration um, is away this week uh, presenting other best practices and good ideas in Ottawa. For today's agenda, we're going to start with a short presentation about higher immigrants to talk a little bit more about the motivation for bringing this webinar series together and really talking about the recently released report. Then I will turn it over and give most of the uh, time in today's webinar for our two presenters, Edric Huang and Marissa Preston, who will go through the programs that they've been leading that really support refugee training, at looking at uh, employment opportunities and connecting with industry. What's really critical and important is that we offer our audience ample time to ask questions, ask for tips, ask for lessons learned from our presenters. So please post your questions as they come to you throughout the presentation, or you can wait until the end of their presentations when we have our dedicated Q&A session. Um, we want to hear from you. I think this is one of the best opportunities for our audience is to be able to connect with our presenters. So a little bit about Hire Immigrants. Hire Immigrants really looks at the second side of the employment dichotomy. We have lots of settlement and employment agencies that work directly with immigrants to get them ready for employment. What Hire Immigrants looks at is the employer side of that relationship. How do we ensure that employers are ready and prepared to receive an immigrant workforce? but also to ensure that they're building inclusive workforces and workforces that allow for newcomers to be able to grow and prosper within those environments. We do that in a number of ways. We talk about the business case, so really ensuring employers recognize that this isn't just a nice to do, but it's a must do. For many of our developed countries with aging populations, the demographics all point to immigrant talent as really meeting the needs of our employers and businesses in order for our economies to continue to thrive and grow. It's identifying outdated hiring practices. If you continue to do the same old practices, you're going to continue to face the same old barriers when it comes to accessing talent, and you're going to continue to get the same old results. And it's about connecting to immigrant talent to our recruiters. So we have a network of service providers, whether it be employment or settlement, here in Canada and abroad. And our goal is to ensure that employers who are committed and interested in investing in immigrant talent to benefit their business as well as their communities, we want to make sure that you're getting connected to the agencies that can help you connect with that talent. A really important role that Higher Immigrants has played over the last two years is as a convener, working alongside Senator Ratna Ahmedvar to pull together a Refugee Jobs Agenda Roundtable, which was initially launched in the Greater Toronto Area in Canada and is now uh, rolled out to a more national model in the last four months. 
The Roundtable model is a really interesting initiative that brings together all of the necessary stakeholders to really ensure inclusion happens and integration happens at the local level. And these are a few of the stakeholders that are involved. And, and I encourage anyone who's looking at starting this in their community, you really do need to have representation from all of these different stakeholders to have a really meaningful uh, conversation, but also an action-oriented agenda. These are just a few of our stakeholders that are involved. And as you can see, it really is a diverse group. We're really thrilled to have Marissa here today talking about the refugee training program. As you can see, Layuna Local is one of our founding members on the roundtable and, and has really been pivotal in showing um, that through collaboration, you can really develop a successful program um, that can be leveraged both for, you know, creating pathways for refugees to access employment opportunities, but also for industries that are really struggling to fill labor shortages. A few of our roundtable outcomes have been, um, again, really practical and action-oriented. Um, and that really comes from our chair, uh, Senator Ratna Ahmedvar, who is incredibly motivated to ensure that when we convene, uh, we're not convening just to have discussions. We're convening for action. We're convening to ensure that we are meeting our objective, which is to support refugees and their employment outcomes. So we created uh, job fairs, which was um, really pivotal in terms of our recruitment of employers. They had to have job vacancies. They had to have a willingness and a readiness to hire. Um, and so there was training um, and um, uh, and collaboration that was required even just leading up to it. We created employer guides, again, to support employers in understanding who is this population, how do you support them, and how do you ensure that they can thrive in your workplace. Um, and we had some really key um, uh, you know, programs that came out, the construction trade program, which you're going to hear from today from Marissa, our Starbucks hiring initiative, and the BDC internship program, which are um, three, I would say, stellar examples of when you lead with industry, um, you really have a, a very strong program um, that ensures that refugees are getting the skills that they need to really thrive in that environment. And so taking a lot of the best practices that came out of the Refugee Roundtable here locally, but also looking internationally with our partners in Germany, in Sweden, in Britain, in Australia, we pulled together a best practices collection, um, which is investing in refugee talent, lessons learned, and labor market integration. And we collaborated with Cities of Migration and the Bertelsmann Stiftung in Germany to really pull together an employer-focused, solution-driven um, document that can really help uh, both community practitioners as well as employers interested in investing in refugee talent understand um, what that journey looks like and what are some of the lessons learned from peers around the world. So I do encourage you, and, and it will be part of the resources that we'll provide to participants post-webinar, um, but I encourage you to look through it. Um, it's very uh, easy to read and um, very, like I said, action-oriented and practical. So please stay connected with Higher Immigrants, visit our website, subscribe to our newsletter. That's the best way to stay informed about webinars and learning exchanges such as these. And we're really excited to have a strong partnership with Cities of Migration to continue to propel this message of employer-focused, action-oriented programming to really support employment of both refugees and, and newcomers more generally. So enough about higher immigrants. We're really here today, and I know our audience is here today, to hear from our two uh, distinguished speakers about programs that have been developed um, with industry in mind and really with employment outcomes at the forefront. So I'm really excited to introduce Edric Kawang, the program associate from Emma's Torch. Edric joined Emma's Torch as a Princeton Project 55 fellow with research experience in refugee resettlement in France. For one of his undergraduate thesis, he volunteered with two humanitarian NGOs to provide mental health and legal aid to asylum seekers living in the streets of Paris. Past roles included advocating for Asian Americans and working as a social impact designer to make affordable housing more accessible for low-income immigrant communities in New Jersey. A native New Yorker, he is ready to uphold his home's rep as a city where dreams do come true. So welcome, Edric. The podium is yours. Please let our audience know about this fantastic initiative in New York called Emma's Torch. Thank you so much, Devin, and thank you so much, everyone, for having me today. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Edric, and I'm really excited to speak to everyone today about our model. 
Um, and so Emma's Torch broadly is a nonprofit social enterprise, and we offer a three-month culinary training program for refugees, asylees, and surrogacy human trafficking to help them begin sustainable careers in the culinary industry in New York City. And I think that our goal is really to collaborate with both people on the refugee resettlement side as well as on the culinary side to make sure that we also serve as this strong conduit to make sure that we're fostering our students who are the refugees as best as possible. And so first, I'll just talk a little bit about our inspirations for creating this particular program. Um, so there was supposed to be a picture of one of our students here, so just imagine that in the background. Um, but I think we can all agree that food is oftentimes our easiest access point into other cultures, whether we're ordering pad thai at a Thai restaurant or enjoying the best Roman pizza. Carrie, our founder and executive director, discovered this as she was volunteering with asylees living in, living in a homeless shelter in D.C. And in creating this organization, we wanted to harness these emotional memories of cooking with grandma or celebrating an iftar with distant relatives and bring that emotional call into the refugee resettlement process. But it's not all just emotional. There's huge turnover in kitchens in a huge metropolitan area like New York. For every 10 cooks a restaurant hires, seven leave within the year. Refugees, on the other hand, through studies conducted by the Tent Partnership and the Migration Policy Institute, have indicated that refugees are valuable. They stay longer and invest more of themselves in their jobs. But it's also important to recognize that meaningful employment is not guaranteed in the U.S. refugee resettlement system. The Office of Refugee Resettlement tries to find jobs for refugees as quickly as possible without complete regard for mismatch of skill sets or mismatch of education. And so that's kind of where we're entering in here. And so our mission is broadly to empower refugees, asylees, and survivors of human trafficking to build new lives and start new careers for the culinary arts. And we do this in two spaces right now. Uh, our first space is our restaurant, which is located in a corner of Carroll Gardens in Brooklyn. And then we also have a uh, cafe space that we opened in February of this year, located in the Brooklyn Public Library's central branch on the corner of Prospect Park. And so the restaurant has been around since May 2018. We are officially one year old in terms of being a restaurant, which is super excited about. Um, but these spaces, importantly, are also the spaces where our students are getting their training. And we find that especially in being this conduit for refugee talent into the culinary industry, one of the most important things we can offer is that on-the-job training. But first, I'll talk a little bit about how we get our students. And so refugees, asylees, and survivors of human trafficking are pretty broad categories. Um, we cover about 10 different visa statuses entering into the U.S. And so we force our students from 40 organizations across New York and New Jersey. And so here on the upper left-hand corner, you'll see the four major refugee resettlement agencies in New York City. Um, on the upper right, you'll see some organizations that are working broadly with immigrants and refugees. In the lower left, you'll see organizations working with um, survivors of human trafficking. And in the lower right, these kind of larger national organizations that still have a stake in kind of helping refugees in particular. The YMCA has six new Americas initiatives throughout New York City. And the Center for Court Innovation tries to provide holistic support for people who are in the court system, such as survivors of human trafficking or those escaping domestic violence. And so broadly, these social service providers, refugee resettlement agencies, and homeless shelters are people, are the organizations where we're getting our students from. And so they're offering, so when we source our students, what we're really looking for is just the flexibility and schedule, which is necessary for the industry itself, and also work authorization. As I might have mentioned earlier, we're a paid program. We offer our students $15 an hour for everything, and that's super important to us because that's part of the empowerment helping them get their, their get their feet in the industry, but also being able to support themselves and their families while they're doing that. And so our students are coming from uh, about 35 countries from all across the world with a huge diversity. Um, they're about 70% female, 30% male. Uh, but no matter what kind of diversity or what kind of background they're bringing into the program, we really want to make sure that we're being a family for our students. And we find this to be an important best practice because we're provide will be becoming their support network in New York. We're becoming their family so that they know that they have someone to turn to. So that is also a part of the empowerment in our program to make sure that they know they can rely on someone. And so on the ground, um, 
this is kind of like what our program looks like. And I'll go through this with some pictures that exist on in the rest of the PowerPoint. Um, but I think the most important thing I want to highlight here is that partnerships are built into every single part of this curriculum, especially from the culinary side. We find that what centers our curriculum is what our students do and is their education. Even if we have a catering opportunity that might turn over some profit to go back into the program, if it's just going to be busy work, if it isn't going to support our students, we turn it down just because we really want to focus on who they are and what they can get. And so partnerships also arise by targeting key elements of the curriculum. And I'll point them out as I go through the next couple of pictures. So during the first month of the program, and as I mentioned earlier, it's a three-month-long program, which adds up to about 600 hours. The first month, we start from the beginning. Students aren't expected to know anything before the program. But what we do provide to them are very important materials to help them realize their value, but also what the industry is like. The knives that the students are holding here in these pictures are all donated from companies like Corin and Beeson, which are the envy of any chef within the industry. And so these are in-kind donors. And we find this to be particularly important because we can tell them to, to understand how to respect their materials and also to help them understand the quality of what they can be capable of when we give them these materials on their first day. And so in their first month, they're primarily learning prep without the pressures of service. That being said, even if they, the herbs that they ship in now during their second week and the tomatoes that they small dice end up on the shakshuka on our brunch menu. They end up in the tomato pepper relish for the lamb meatballs on our dinner and happy hour menu. And this is also important for them to see kind of that their work is actually going somewhere. During the second month of the program, our students are working on the line, which means that they're actually cooking during service. And so they have, they, they can say that they have the experience of working in a professional American kitchen even before they finish the program. What's really cool here is that we also have a lot of partnerships with restaurants across New York City, such as the US, such as the Union Square Hospitality Group, or USHG, which is being Meyer's company, as well as Empeon, and also HMS Host, which is the company that basically owns every single restaurant and every single airport in North America. And so the, the executive chefs of these organizations come into our space to teach master classes and demos to talk to these students about kind of the practical element of the industry. We want to make sure that our students understand that the good habits that we're teaching them aren't just us kind of like patronizing and kind of like lecturing them. These are real things that real chefs are also looking for when they're hiring. During the third month of the program, our students move on to the cafe. And this is when they're working both back of house cooking and also front of house which is interacting with our guests. And so here they learn barista, they get free barista training from our coffee pay purveyor, Equator Coffee, and also get customer service training from our front of house staff as well as myself. And so we find that this has been particularly useful because it's not always about the hard skills or the technical skills, but also about the soft skills, about being comfortable communicating with strangers in a foreign context and making sure that they know how to do that. And we find that that customer service and the guest facing interaction has helped that tremendously. It has helped a lot of our students go through the interview process much better. And talking about soft skills, we also have a lot of partnerships that encourage practice interviews and also practice trails, which are working auditions, to make sure that our students are comfortable navigating the job placement process even before they actually do it. And we, we find that a lot of people are really eager to help us out and really eager to offer these kinds of resources to our students. And then finally, our students have a graduation dinner, which is also the kind of final exam. And so here, our students are cooking food from their own country, their home countries. They're cooking from their heart and presenting it to about 25 guests who pay upwards of 150 to 250 US dollars for a ticket. Um, and it's not only for our students to see that people are willing to pay money for their food, but also oftentimes there's a guest chef cooking with our students. And so this is our students' chance to actually interact with someone in the industry even before they go out and find that job. And so this is another opportunity for them to work directly, very closely, and ask all the questions they want to someone who owns a restaurant and who has the experience. And so next I kind of wanted to just um, show you some quotes and some some of our success in the program thus far. So here is Najla, who's one of our alumni uh, from Haiti. And she said that at the beginning, whenever chef told me you can do anything, I always got chills down my back. Now I actually believe it. Now I actually believe I can do it. Um, she graduated from our program last August. 
uh, after only being in the country for about eight months. And she's currently working at RH Rooftop Restaurant, uh, which is this beautiful restaurant in the Meatpacking District in New York City, right next to the Whitney Museum. And she also said that when she came into the country, she wasn't really sure what she was going to do, especially with a baby girl. But now we can support her. Uh, and here is a quote from one of our employers uh, who Juliana from Congo Bazza View uh, works at Missy, which is one of the hottest Italian restaurants in New York City, um, and they're extremely excited to have her there. So thus far, since May of 2018, which is when our program really took off and really began, 69 students have enrolled. Um, we have 46 graduates and 19 currently enrolled. There's a small attrition, and oftentimes that attrition are students during the program realizing that they actually don't really want to be there anymore. They actually don't really want to cook. And I think that's also important because we aren't trying to force anyone to do work that they want, don't want to do. And thankfully, 98% of job seeking graduates have secured employment in the industry, and we're constantly checking in to make sure that our graduates are also okay um, every single month through the first year of graduation. And that's our opportunity to make sure that they are enjoying their job, but also if their employer is doing well. And so here's a list of a couple of the employers that we have in New York. Um, and I think that one challenge that we're currently facing, especially as we are getting to um, be one year old, is talking more seriously about how to better onboard our students with these employers, especially realizing that our graduates nine months out experience something very different than someone one month out. Some of these organizations are also on our culinary council, which is an informal council of chefs who also advise about our curriculum. So we check in with them and reach out with them here and there to make sure that we can um, make sure that our curriculum makes sense, but also engage them and help them realize that they are actually making a difference. And so in terms of moving forward, uh, short-term goals, we're constantly trying to iterate about the dining and program experience. We start a new cohort of six students every single month. And so we have a lot of opportunity to change the curriculum and see what works. Uh, we're also trying to expand our catering operations a lot more outside of the restaurants. Uh, and then finally, also expand our awareness. And then finally, long term, we are actually trying to expand nationally in the short in the long term, uh, first to a metropolitan area and then to more resistant areas, um, such as the flyover states in the middle of the country. Um, and then also largely to change the narrative around refugees in the industry. And so thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. And thank you so much for coming on to this uh, conference call. Um, that's our Instagram handle and our Facebook handle, as well as our website. So please definitely check us out. And if you're ever in New York, definitely come by for a meal. Thank you so much, Edric. What a fantastic presentation. And I um, am both hungry and really need to book a flight to uh, New York City to come check out the restaurant. It looks delicious, and it's such a fantastic program. I know I have lots of questions, and I'm sure our audience is going to have lots of questions for the Q&A. Um, so if you do, audience members, please submit them now, or you can wait until after Marissa's presentation and submit them and, and, and ask Edric kind of any question that you have about this fantastic uh, program. Thank you so much again, Edric. <clears throat> now we're going to turn our attention to Marissa Preston from Layuna Local, who's going to tell us a bit more about the um, training program that, that she's been at the head of um, in Toronto. A little bit about Marissa. Marissa has over 15 years experience assisting persons with barriers to enter into employment with a focus on apprenticeship and construction. Marissa started her career with Job Start in 1999 as a summer student and held various positions from frontline staff to management. In 2010, Marissa became the coordinator of the Hammerheads program that supports youth from 13 priority neighborhoods in the city of Toronto. In 2013, Marissa joined Leona Local 506 Training Center as the partnership and business development lead. Marissa works with the training center team to build capacity, increase apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs, and provides training to various community community groups throughout the greater Toronto area. Marissa is currently on the board of directors of the Toronto Community Benefits Network and the Dovercourt Boys and Girls Club and is an alumnus of the Governor General's Canada Leadership Conference. Marissa brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise in this area and so please submit your questions as she goes through her presentation. Marissa, I'm going to turn over the podium to you and uh, you can begin your presentation.
Marissa, if your phone is still muted, you'll just need to unmute yourself so that we can hear you. How about now? Perfect. <laughs> okay, I'll start over. So, as Devin said, um, I am the Business and Partnership Development Lead here at 506 Training Center. I will get into a bit more of what 506 does. So this means that I'm working with our government, business, the employers, and community partners. Uh, the most important piece of my job, though, is recruiting new apprentices, ensuring they find employment uh, once they've completed their apprenticeship in school training with us at the training center. So LIUNA, it stands for the Labor's International Union of North America. We are North American-wide. We have over 500,000 members and 400 locals. LIUNA Local 506, we represent workers within the GTA up to actually Penetang, so north part of uh, the province, and we represent over 8,000 workers in construction, industrial, and the hospitality sectors. So here at the 506 Training Center, we receive funding for four different apprenticeships. So these apprenticeships are funded by the same ministry, the Ministry of Training Colleges and, Colleges and Universities, that funds employment programs, and obviously the colleges and universities here in Ontario. So the four apprenticeships that we do have, Construction Craft Worker, this is our signatory apprenticeship. This encompasses a little bit about of everything LIUNA does. It's important for everyone to know LIUNA is a different type of union, construction trade union. We're not like the plumbers, the electricians, the carpenters, the iron workers. We encompass many different trades. Um, so when people come to LIUNA for construction craft worker, they'll learn a little bit just about laboring. They'll learn some form work, concrete sawing and drilling. They'll learn about uh, concrete laboring, uh, being a mason tender, which tends to our bricklayers, uh, waterproofing, and demolition. So within construction craft worker, they get a little bit of everything. As you can see, it's a 2,400-hour um, apprenticeship. That means in class and on the job. Precast is another apprenticeship that we run. Um, it is all prefabricated forms, big concrete forms that are erected onto condo buildings, big box stores. You, you'll see them everywhere. If you look, you'll see it. Just big prefabricated forms. It's, a, it's highly skilled. Welding is involved for some of them. Uh, concrete finishing is. And we do all the training here. And then they go out and work with one of our contractors. Concrete finishing is pretty much self explanatory, and then our hazardous material worker, which is for the demolition sector. It's removing asbestos, lead and mold, all the hazardous material. Toronto is full of asbestos and all these different materials within the buildings. We are in need of hazmat workers, and we have been recruiting like crazy for them. We just continually run these programs. At the 506 Training Center, our main focus is apprenticeship, but we also do membership training constantly during the week and on weekends. So that's from health and safety to equipment to improving some skills. And then we also do community programming. So community programming is like the newcomer, the Syrian trade program. Uh, we do our own pre-apprenticeship. We do some health and safety for local high schools and introduce high school students to apprenticeship also. So what we're here for today, the Newcomer Trade Program, uh, which initially was the Syrian, it was for Syrian refugees. So we work closely with Access Employment to deliver this program. Access was actually, um, they did most of the, well, they did all of the recruiting. They did language training. They provided numerous supports to participants, and we really did this four-week hands-on training with them. So we did all the mandatory health and safety training, equipment training, and basic power tool and hand tools. So as I said, partners, we access employment. They 
delivered, it was construction specific training so that when participants join the four week hands on training, they had knowledge of the construction language. Uh, they worked with us to develop, well, to use the materials that we use to deliver to develop the language training. Um, then they did all the recruiting. And I've got their website there if you want to visit them and see the work that they've done. Also, we work with the Ontario Masonry Training Center, which is like LIUNA. We have a training center. Um, and they, we took turns actually delivering this four-week um, training. So the forklift and elevated work platform training. So when we were deciding what to deliver in this four weeks to give uh, the participants an idea of construction here in Canada, we knew that this would benefit them. Um, people were of, of all ages. We had 26-year-olds. We had 55-year-olds. So not everyone wanted to work construction, but what we wanted to provide was training that allowed them to look at other opportunities in other uh, sectors and to get, get a job that paid enough that they could support their families. So with both the forklift and the scissor lift or the elevated work platform, they were able to, if they wanted to join LIUNA, look into our apprenticeships, they could do that, or they could move forward and look at different sectors, uh, like retail, for instance. You know, you go to a Walmart, you'll see someone on an elevated work platform. It's a bit different looking than that. It's a smaller one. But, you know, stocking shelves uh, in the industrial sector and warehouse settings. So people were able not only to get jobs in construction, they could work with access at the end of our training and then look for a job in different sectors. So we also did power tools and hand tools with the participants. This, this is actually done, we do this with all of our apprentices because it gives them an idea and it gives our instructors an idea of how much the skills that they actually come with, knowing how to cut, knowing how to measure, using a hammer. Everyone comes here saying they have a lot of experience and they've, got, they've worked with their uncle or they've worked on this job site and then they get here and we ask them to build something simple, like this birdhouse that you see, and they can't use a measuring tape. So it allows us to see, and it allows them to see what we're looking for and what our contractors, just basic skills that our contractors require. But the good thing is um, we also train them, especially in the power tools, and we were able to give them uh, tickets saying that they were successful in doing the safety and using the tools. So I know not everyone here is from Ontario. So um, in Ontario, we have mandatory training that all workers in construction require. So working at heights, it is a full day course with an exam and hands-on test at the end. And it expires every three years. So workers have to take this. Um, it is very important to us as a training center that we deliver this in the proper way because this is one of the main causes of death on job sites is uh, people falling from height. WIMIS, it expires every year, and uh, the Ministry of Labor, Four Steps to Health and Safety. It's actually a very, very simple course that they can take online, but we did deliver it to them here so that they had it and we knew they um, were ready to go to work when they were finished here. So. For the regular person coming into Local 506, so for anyone, um, they could be referred from a member, they could be referred from a community organization, they could be a newcomer to Canada. The process to get into 506 is right here. It's actually quite lengthy because once you're a member of LIUNA, you're a member for life. So we want to ensure that we are recruiting the best. Uh, we want our contractors to know that we recruit well and when people leave here, we want them to go to work, work hard, work safe, go home at the end of the day to their families. And so the process to get into 506 is here. They apply online. We do have an orientation where they do a reading and math assessment. They complete a hands-on assessment, which is a full day, and then they attend an interview. If they get through all that, then we offer them a seat in one of our four 
uh, apprenticeship program. They're all eight weeks, except for the hazardous material worker, which is only five. If they do successfully complete the apprenticeship in school training, then we offer them membership into Local 506, where then they go on to an out-of-work list, and I work closely with our contractors and make sure they get dispatched to their first job. So it's also important to know that Local 506 has signatory contractors that must hire from us. So we have over a 1,000 contractors in all those different sectors I mentioned before that have to call our hiring hall and hire our people. So we, if someone gets through our process and they're good, they're successful, they get a job. So this has been, um, you know, we've been doing this since about 2017. And like any program when you start, there are, you know, good, bad days. There's, you know, things you learn. So we've, we've learned a lot working closely with Access. Um, when we first met, it was actually at the Syrian, the round table with Devin. I met with uh, their CEO, Allison Pond, and we had a conversation about that we could put both of our, the skills and our abilities together and really put a nice program together to help the Syrian newcomers when they came to Canada. So unfortunately, our funding model was a bit uh, confusing for not, it was confusing on our end. So um, the, the hands-on training was funded through the province and the language training was funded through the Fed. And unfortunately, they weren't talking as much as uh, we thought they were, and it it wasn't always aligned, and it was creating work for both Access and 506. So for me moving forward, I would ensure that either the funding came from one person or they were chatting, and it wasn't Access and 506 trying to chase them to get money. Um, this was a very, very important project. We were willing to, you know, put out time, make sure our you know, instructors, this is on the 506 end, were trained and understanding where the Syrian newcomers were coming from and understanding that, you know, it, it wasn't the same background as someone walking off the street of Toronto. And, it, you know, it was, it was hard to get funding and keep funding. Um, the other thing is, you know, having clear understanding of clients' expectations. You know, everyone has a different expectation. And the training was specific for the newcomers to Canada. It was to give them the skills to help them find meaningful employment. The majority of the participants were so eager to work and they were so excited to gain skills and experience through the 506 Training Center. They were here to learn. But then you always have a few bad apples and it's actually not their fault. It's all to do with funding and the way the government handles newcomers and refugees specifically. And it was a lesson learned on our end. Uh, we did have a very small group of people um, that when they, were jo they joined, they wanted a letter confirming they were in training. They wanted us to send a letter to the government because this kept the government off their backs. Um, they made us aware from day one that they were not interested in working for Layuna, that they were currently working under the table and they were able to get the funding from the government to keep their lifestyle. The problem is that the government cuts them right off as soon as they start working, so they can't even get ahead. So it doesn't make sense for them to start working for $22, $23 an hour when they're going to be making less. And the government really doesn't work with industry to understand what we can provide to newcomers to Canada. and. This is, to me, a fault on the government, the federal government's end. Instead of speaking with us, finding out what we could do and working with us and working with newcomers and understanding their specific needs, um, it, it then makes them not move forward. And I do have to stress, that was a very small uh, group of people, but it still happened. And it, to me, it was sad because we lost you know, seven or eight people that we could have moved forward into training. Um, we also learned that the newcomers from Syria, many of them had successful businesses and were they were successful 
in different professions, not just construction. And this is a loss of power for them having to start over in Canada. And we actually saw, you know, we saw some sad faces and, you know, people that were just, we had one guy, he was in his early 60s and he was, he was sad. He was sad he had to start over. And this had to be an understanding on our end, understanding that not everyone wants to go out and work construction and work hard because it's not easy work. Um, we had one specific case that this older gentleman, he was in his 50s, he had a really, really successful pr um, business in Syria, and it was all to do with natural stone, and he showed us, and he did wonderful stuff. So after he was done the four-week modular training, we actually put him right in with a contractor. And this contractor worked at Brickworks, which in Toronto is a it's it's an old brick manufacturing plant that they've turned into a historic site and they have a farmers market it's gorgeous but it's falling apart so this specific participant he actually went and worked for the company that was doing the restoration he did such wonderful work the executive director of brickworks called and asked me about him and where he came from and how, what training we provided, and I had to explain. It wasn't us, it was actually him. He came from Syria and he had learned everything there. He's now holding two union cards, this man. He's, um, he holds a 506 union card. He also owns a, holds a local two union card, which allows him to lay black brick, and he can also labor if it's slow. He's very smart for doing it. Um, he's working for one of our contractors. Um, he's actually not doing restoration anymore. He's now actually laying uh, brick and stone, and he's doing very, very well. So, um, you know, we had to understand each individual client and their expectations. So it, it, that, if we had to go back, we would get to know them a lot better and sit down with them. Um, and then due to mandatory health and safety and apprenticeship training, we found language levels, we needed longer language training, uh, which Access knew, uh, but just due to funding, it, once we go back, we go back to funding again, it was very difficult. Uh, we found that level uh, six, seven, the Canadian language benchmark six, seven was really the sweet spot for people coming in. Um, we also had um, other community partners that we had partnered with for, for mental health, for settlement, translation, and in theory it sounded really good, but it got a little confusing on who handled what. Clients uh, sometimes got confused. They told stories, different places, and things, it was like broken telephone. Stories weren't complete, and if we had to do this all over again, now that we actually have, we've just done a massive renovation of 46,000 square feet, um, and we have space, <laughs> we would invite everyone to really work out of here and be all under one roof so that there's one story and one understanding and not, you know, three or four different ones. So we have now expanded our outreach. We've been working with many service providers, uh, pre-apprenticeship programs that are servicing newcomers because we've had a lot of success with the Syrian newcomers. We wanted to ensure we are providing opportunities um, to everyone. So access has been our main support for recruiting and uh, now we've expanded our outreach and we're really working closely with another program called Building Up, which is a social enterprise that provides upgrading, employment and settlement services. Uh, Building Up prepares pr participants to join directly into our Level 1 programs. And they do all of this through uh, an employment prep program they have, and it's on-the-job training that is paid. So they actually go do little small construction projects. They're paid. They'll work with them. There's no program link there. So they'll work with them. They might work there for a year. They might work there for two months. But when they feel they're ready, they actually have them apply to 506 and they go through that rigorous um, process. So if I was to do this all over again, like I said, the main thing is to have your partners under one roof and increase the communication and have more of a holistic program. Um, due to space, we really couldn't do that at the time, but you know, if there was space, that's really how we should have done it. Um, so the Lyuna Local 506, uh, what makes, what 
I always go back to the government talking to them about this because all the upfront work that gets done, for instance, access, has done so much work with so many different Syrian newcomers. And to this day, we still have people applying. So access may have worked with them three years ago, two years ago. They may never have worked with access, but someone that worked with access got a job through 506, and now they refer people to us directly instead of going through access. So none of that is actually captured, which is too bad because it's it's you know it's the snowball effect, and we keep feeding off it. Fortunately for us, we can continue using this um, group of people through the Syrians that we've trained and have employed. So currently, we've got 25 new uh, or 25 Syrian newcomers uh, working with one of our signatory contractors. All their starting salary, salaries are ranging from $22 to $24 plus their pension and benefits. We've had three of them already finish their apprenticeships, which is quite impressive. There's a lot of work going on in Toronto, so people are getting overtime. I actually met uh, one of the participants at the LCBO, the liquor store, here in Toronto. He lives near me, and he just told me he's just got his He's a third-term apprentice, so he's making $33 an hour. He's working at one of the biggest construction sites downtown Toronto. And he told me he's moving. He's going to be buying a condo in the next couple months. So for someone who's only lived in Canada for two years, he's doing very well. That's really right. unheard of. I yep. read, but not, to, not to interrupt, we just have one minute left for your presentation, then we've got to move on to the, the Q&A portion. Okay, I'm done. So I was just going to say, in 2019, we've got four refugees actually in the programs right now that were referred from building up, um, and they're actually they're refugees uh, from Africa, so a totally different population. So that's it. So I, um, you know, I hope I got through everything, and if anyone has any questions, I'm here. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Marissa. And I'm, I usually have to start us off with a few prepared questions, but as you can see, we have lots of questions from our attendees. So we're going to start with those, and if we have time at the end, I'll ask a few of my questions that I have as well. But fabulous presentations, both Edric and Marissa. And as you can see from the questions, um, it generated a lot of interest. And so um, I'll start with Edric. Um, could you walk through a little bit more of the selection criteria that you have for applicants to the MS Torch program? Of course. So in the presentation, I mentioned that the two absolute musts are flexibility and schedule, which is a need for, which is a need for the industry itself. And so we ask that the applicant is working. So they're working with us 40 hours a week, five days a week, so it's a full-time commitment uh, during an alternating schedule between mornings and evenings and weekends. Um, so that's a must. The other must is just work authorization. And so we know that this precludes asylum seekers who have not been in the United States for six months yet, um, but refugees and asylees all have valid work authorization when they arrive. Um, outside of that, it's really just a passion for um, cooking and the passion for food, we find that that is oftentimes the biggest asset that our students add to their potential employers afterwards. And that's something that's really hard to teach. Um, and then I know there's a question about language further down. Um, we ask for kind of like basic comprehension of English. We do not expect fluency. We do not expect um, professional working proficiency, so long as they're able to express something about themselves, express that kind of passion, whether it's through body language or words, and also have an understanding of the language so that they can understand the classes, which are for the most part taught in English. Um, that's all I really expect. Fantastic. And, and so, Marissa, a similar question for the training program uh, here in Toronto. What's the criteria for admission for the individuals that come to La Una? And thinking through in the Canadian context, um, we have asylum seekers and, uh, you know, landed refugees that, that receive permanent residency upon landing. And so for, you know, asylum seekers that are awaiting hearing, you know, is there, um, you know, what's the consideration that Layuna has for, for those individuals? So kind of two parts, what's the general criteria for admissions, and then um, how do you navigate um, different status for, for refugees? Okay, so for just anyone applying, 
you have to, they're supposed to have a, gr a minimum of grade 10. And that's pretty much it. We need someone who wants to work hard, but we get all that through the hands-on assessment. We can see if someone can physically get through. So they have to have a grade 10. Education. For uh, convention refugees, permanent residents, they actually, because they don't, a lot of them don't come with paperwork, um, the ministry doesn't make them show any education requirements, which is great. <laughs> so we can just tick the box as um, a refugee and move forward. They just have to want to work in construction and be able to do our eight-week apprenticeship. Um, for asylum seekers, so I'm assuming that is a refugee claimant. Correct, yeah. Uh, okay, so a lot of them have stipulations on their work permits that say they can't take training programs or join education programs. Because it's only eight weeks, what we do is we work, so we've taken a lot of claimants through building up, not a lot, but I'd say about seven or eight. So we don't get funding from the government because they are claimants, unfortunately. So what we've done is we've worked closely with Building Up in another program called Construction Connections, which is funded through the City of Toronto and the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities, and they will provide the funding for the seat fee. So we've been working closely with them, and they'll pay their seat fee. And then if their work permit doesn't expire for a year or two, we're happy to bring them into the union and get them working. That's fantastic, Marissa, and I think that speaks to um, really employer leadership and industry leadership at, at finding an alternative way. Um, so, you know, if the, if the first pathway that has been, you know, the typical path um, doesn't work for a certain applicant or a certain candidate, um, you know, trying to support them and, and finding an alternate route. I mean, if they're, and to Edric's point, if they're passionate and eager to start working and eager to, to um, get started in training, um, it really is, and we really do need to look to industry and to our, our training programs to help these newcomers find alternative ways to, to access the programs that are available, especially in these um, you know, high-need areas uh, in terms of labor shortages. Mm -hmm. This next question is, is for both you, uh, Edric, and Marissa, and I think it's something that has consistently come up across this series um, is really around how do you engage employers? And so uh, this is a question that I had had myself. And so, Edric, we'll start with you. Uh, you talked really extensively about all the different partners that you have, whether it's partners that are, are providing in-kind donations for your training facility um, or industry partners, you know, restaurants that are open and, and willing to hire the graduates from your program. Um, and so how do you go about fostering those relationships? How do you get employers um, really to see the value of the program and the candidates that you're producing um, and to, to really invest in, in, in support the MS Torch initiative? Yeah, great question. So I think there are a couple of different ways. Uh, I think on the employment end itself, it's kind of uh, making sure that they are aware of who the candidates we're sending them are. And I think we try to be as transparent as possible about kind of the strengths as well as the weaknesses of someone so that it's not kind of like we're trying to trick them into employing anyone. And I think that's really important because at that point, you're also setting up that relationship and making sure that the employer is completely aware of what they're getting themselves into. Uh, on the partnership end, I think that um, we have, we kind of tap into the sense of like, helping develop new chefs and kind of helping develop new talent. And I think a lot of people are interested in that initiative, particularly in the restaurant industry, because of the fact that um, there is such a labor shortage, there is such a labor gap between the opportunities and the people, and of course, that turnover. And so kind of presenting it within that lens of kind of like, we can benefit you in this way, and this is kind of what you're affecting. Um, people like that, and people like to feel good about what they're contributing back to. So really making sure that they're aware of the initiative and being completely honest and completely um, clear and cogent about the way that you're explaining it is super important. Um, I think on the uh, kind of going back to the employer on like the onboarding end, I think it's also kind of like 
making sure that they're aware that by helping refugees and asylees and survivors of human trafficking, who are oftentimes some of the most vulnerable people, um, you're not only developing something for them, you're developing something for everyone. Right? If you're helping the person who is presumably at the bottom of the ladder, then you're also helping everyone who's above that because you're only making things more clear and better for everyone around. And so really communicating that point and helping them realize that they're not doing something separate, they're really just enhancing who they are and what they stand for is better. Um, on the kind of like more business side of things, especially for in-kind donors, like we're very active and very vocal about advertising um, and marketing, the fact that like we are working with these organizations. And I think they also benefit from that. Like I think if they can tap into these networks of people who are willing to donate, for example, to a nonprofit, um, that also kind of looks back, it reflects well on them. And so that kind of also helps us make the business case of like, we can promote you. Yeah, no, it, it, and I think it's important um, to remember that, that they are businesses at the end of the day. So it's, it's either supporting their business bottom line, which is they need talent and they're facing labor shortages, or if, if they can't directly hire, it's, it's how do we promote them as employers who are invested in this cause and, and want to support employment outcomes and, and finding alternative ways for them to either make donations or, or in-kind donations. I think I think that's spot on, and, and I think it's speaking the business language and, and putting it in terms that they'll, that they'll appreciate and that they'll get. Marissa, from your perspective with the um, employers that you work with at, at Layuna, you know, when you were first introducing this program, this refugee training program, how did you approach talking with employers, talking um, with the businesses that you that you work with at the at the trade union, and, and getting their buy-in to um, support the employment of these of these newcomers? So, the one thing about Layuna is we're we are lucky because we have signatory contractors. So, when you have over a thousand contractors that have to hire from you. At least you have a pool. Um, but it is, it's actually an education piece to get employers to hire apprentices, period. So I've just learned by doing that I need to speak with the owners of the company and then have them trickle it down to their foreman that these apprentices that are coming on the job site don't have experience, they're green, set them up with a journeyman and make sure that they're getting supported on the job. So that's for all apprentices. The Syrian newcomers, it's, uh, it's actually quite impressive, the, the support we had from our employers. When I told them we were doing this program, I connected with employers that I've worked with for a few years, and I know want to hire and train people and give people opportunities. And sometimes I just use the same employers over and over again, and it works. Um, I've developed relationships with some employers that understand apprenticeship. They un now they understand newcomers, some of the challenges they face. And now that they've had this one guy, he's got three Syrian newcomers on his job site, and he's watched them buy cars and, you know, join his what is it called, like his after work, you know, he had like a dinner party or something. At first they wouldn't come and, you know, now they're kind of part of the crew and he's watched that and he's watched them develop and become part of his company. And when he goes to his association meetings, so if it's a brick and stone company, he goes to his association meetings and there's 15 other employers sitting around there and they're complaining about, I can't find people to work, I can't find people to lay brick, I can't find, he says, Call Marissa over at the 506 Training Center. She's doing this program. I've had nothing but success. And then I get three or four phone calls. So I always think, like, it takes those little successes and one employer buy-in to start speaking to the rest of the industry, and then I get phone calls. It also happened with the formwork. I sent two Syrian newcomers to one of the formwork companies. They're so happy. They, I got another call from another massive formwork company, and now they're going to take a couple of our apprentices. So it's, you know, I always say it's small successes that build, we can just keep building on. I think that's such a great point because I think often we start a program and we hit the ground running and we try to scale it really quickly. Um, but the better approach is to uh, really demonstrate the value with a few key industry stakeholders or a few key employers. Um, and to your point, 
and the community becomes very small. People, you know, word of mouth is still uh, a powerful promotion tool. And so if you demonstrate value with a few, um, it quickly becomes many. So I think that's a really great example. We are at time, but Edric and Marissa, there are still a few really great questions. And so if I can, can borrow just a little bit more of your time, we'll, we'll ask two more questions, and then we'll, we'll wrap up so everyone can enjoy uh, the rest of their Thursday. Edric and Marissa, does that sound OK? Yep. yep. Okay, perfect. So um, this is for both of you, and, and Marissa, maybe we'll start with you this time. Um, oftentimes with training programs, and I know we've got a lot of practitioners on the webinar today, um, you do this great pre-employment training program, and, and then what's the next step? How do you ensure that the individual that has completed this training um, doesn't drop off or drop out or lose motivation to continue on to, to look for those employment opportunities? Is there you know, any uh, tip that you could provide in terms of that follow-up after um, the initial training or pre-employment um, training has been completed? And Marissa, we'll start with you. Marissa, OK. So this is where partnerships come in, and they're so important. So with access, if someone didn't want to join 506, so we do this four-week training, and then if they want to move forward. We think they have the skills. We offer them one of our four apprenticeship programs. For those who thought, good Lord, I can't do this, or, you know, this isn't for me, we had a partner. So we were able to refer them back to Access. And then Access, they have a huge pool of employer partners also, not all construction, in all different sectors, which is fantastic. So they could support the participants that didn't want to go into construction, maybe they wanted to go into warehousing or do a forklift job. So they were able to support them that way. Um, of course, there were, our, we actually had a few that came into our concrete finishing. And you know what? It was just not for them. We got them out there, and they just they chose to leave on their own. So sometimes construction can, you know, you get four days one week, you get six days the next, you get two the next. And some of them just couldn't handle that. And that's not just with the newcomer population, that's with any population. So some people don't, they want five days a week, Monday to Friday, and they can't handle the overtime and the maybe go home early. So it doesn't work for everyone. Um, and do, people do drop off. But I would say Access was very a good partner because they were able to support those that no longer want to be part of LIUNA or didn't want to join LIUNA in the first place. That's fantastic. So having that wraparound uh, service provider that can really uh, jump in to fill the gaps uh, if, if, you know, it just isn't a good fit um, at, at the current program. Edric, you know, uh, your candidates go through um, such a phenomenal training program. They get experience um, at MS Torch, you know, in the restaurant industry. What's your next step after they've completed the program? How do you support them in, in landing that first job um, and making sure that they don't kind of take this training and then um, either drop off or, or life gets in the way and, and, and getting to that first employment opportunity doesn't happen? What, what's your intervention there? Yeah, so we offer job placement to every single graduate who goes through the program. And so in the third month when they're in the program, we begin talking very seriously about career planning. So it's not only about that first job or that first month, but also the next five years. What do you want to do? And what's the best step in order for you to get there? And so in that career planning, one conversation that always happens is kind of like, what do you want to do right now? And then what do you want to do in one year? And where do you want to be in three years? Um, and especially given all that information, I take that information and talk to our culinary team to kind of think about what, where where would be the best opportunity for this student to go? And we vet every single employer who we place a student in to make sure that their chefs and their higher level sous chefs are people who can be supportive and empathetic and are willing to be patient to help our students continue to grow and continue to learn. And that's a conversation that we also have every directly. We meet them in person. We go to them to make sure that they are kind of like aware of what they're getting when they get them. Um, and so after that initial job placement, so the job placement process is run primarily through me. I set up the interview by kind of emailing the employer, and then the student goes off to the interview and that trail by themselves. And so I'm not kind of accompanying them at that point. It's really on them to show their skills and their development. 
Um, once they land a job, we check in with our students once a month throughout the entire first year. And the reason why we do that is one, for funding and for grant writing and metric tracking, but also more seriously to make sure that we're doing exactly what your question is posing, to make sure that the student is maintaining their motivation, especially if they face new challenges. I think we tend to spoil our students a little bit in the program because we try to be as attentive and accommodating as possible while still being tough on them. Um, but that's not going to be the reality of the industry. And so we check in with them once a month. Every single graduate is assigned a mentor from the core staff of our team. And so we have seven core staff members, um, three chefs, two general managers, uh, me, and our executive director. And so they're assigned one of us, and we check in with them once online, online every other month, and in person um, on the other month. Um, and so we that's our way of saying like how their life is doing, how their job is doing, helping them through those salary negotiations, helping them through problems with coworkers and everything. Um, and the incentive there for them is really to come back and like still be a part of the family, which is why I feel like that was a really important part of building the program. That's fantastic. And I think I think what Edric and Marissa have both spoken to is that it's not just about pumping candidates through employment training, getting them to in a job and kind of saying, uh, great, we did a fantastic job. Um, that's a great metric and goal to have, but it's also ensuring that they're supported throughout their employment and um, throughout the training um, and understand kind of what those next steps are from the beginning and feel supported throughout that process. Um, fantastic. We are well over time, so I appreciate Edric and Marissa um, you staying on and answering our questions. For those of you that had questions that we didn't get to, please email them to hireimmigrants at ryerson.ca, and I'll be happy to coordinate with Marissa and or Edric to get the information that you're looking for to promote these types of programs in your own communities and with your own populations. Thank you for everyone who has attended the session today. On behalf of myself and our participants, please let me thank um, Cities of Migration for allowing us to host on their platform today and our distinguished presenters, Edger Huang from Emma's Torch and Marissa Preston from Layuna Local for such a brilliant exchange of programs. I think the questions speak for themselves. When you have an audience that's engaged, it means it really was quality content. So thank you so much. Thank you to Claire Ellis for impeccable technical support here at Ryerson University and helping us make sure that everything runs smoothly. To our audience in Cities of Migration every Everywhere. Imagine this excellent work being interpreted in your city, adapted by your organization, or changing your net neighborhood. We'd like to hear your st stories and share more good practices, so please stay connected, please reach out, and please follow up with me if you have additional questions, comments, or would like to connect with our presenters for more information.